all my presentation load, I, I want to take the opportunity again to thank the organizing committee for the honor of being here. Um, and I also want to apologize to Dr. Mashari about this talk, because uh, I know that he gave a great talk on one anastomosis gastric bypass. So here are my financial disclosures, but I think the biggest disclosure that I want to that I want to talk about before I, I get any deeper into this talk is that I don't, uh, we don't offer one anastomosis gastric bypass as a primary procedure at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, which is where I, I practice now. Um, so I, I don't like to criticize operations that I don't have any experience with. So really what I want to do is go over some of the available data. Um, we do have a lot of experience with managing complications of one anastomosis gastric bypass, um, and we're actually pulling our most recent data, and hopefully we're going to be publishing it soon. So um, Dr. Mashari talked about this. I think that the one anastomosis gastric bypass, as we know it today, uh, follows a description by Dr. Rutledge in, the, in 1997. And basically the principles is a tubular gastric pouch with an omega loop configuration of an enthesite or side-to-side -side gastrogenosomy, depending on, on what technique you describe. And the, the, the main idea behind uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass was to make the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass easier to perform and also safer for our patients. And I, again, I always like to go back and look at the history. And if you go back to the original description of the gastric bypass from the 1960s, from Dr. Mason and Ito, the original description, as you can see in this, um, in, in this uh, middle picture, was actually a somewhat larger pouch, but, but with a loop uh, configuration. So, you know, in, in certain ways, physiologically similar to what we see today with the one anastomosis gastric bypass, even though the, the, the description of the pouch is very different. But the reason that the, the original gastric bypass was transformed to a Roux and Y configuration was because of the complications that were seen at the time, mainly with, with uh, alkaline reflux. So in, in, in certain ways, I think we're, we're seeing a little bit of a trend of going back uh, into the future and, you know, similar in the era of peptic ulcer operations, the Bill Ruff II operation lost its popularity for the same reason. And I think that for many of us in the bariatric community, I think that these are some of the, the concerns that we have about one anastomosis gastric bypass. And even though we're starting to see some longer term data, I, I think this, this story is yet to be told. And going back to this principle of making an operation uh, safer uh, for, for the patients, I think that we have to recognize that probably one of the biggest ad advances in the last 10 years for bariatric and metabolic surgery is specifically about safety. And if you look at the complication rate uh, of operations like a gastric bypass, especially in higher risk populations like diabetic patients, it is much safer than many common operations that we perform in the general surgery practice, such a, as an appendectomy or a cholecystectomy. And in the same way, the mortality of these operations is uh, very rare nowadays. So when you look at the data from, you know, 10, 13 years ago, and you look at the data from just a few years ago, there has been a significant improvement in the complications and the mortality rates seen with common operations like the gastric bypass and the laparoscopic sleeve. So in this publication for J from JAMA back from 2010, we were talking about a 3.6% complication rate for a roux y gastric bypass. Ten years later, that's cut in more than half to only 1.4. And similar to a sleeve, when we were talking about 2.2% .2 in 2010, that's down to sub-1% numbers in 2020. So talking about the, the one anastomosis gastric bypass, naturally most of the data that is available right now compares the one anastomosis gastric, the gastric bypass to other operations such as the SADI uh, sleeve and, and standard bypass. And if you look at least the data for early complications in, in series of one anastomosis gastric bypass, compared to modern series of Roux and Y gastric bypass, at least in the early part of the operations, there's really not a significant difference. Now, late complications, I think that this is a very broad topic because you can talk about uh, complications that we worry about, such as marginal ulcers, internal hernias, which can happen after 
either Roux-en-Y or one in osmosis gastric bypass, but we also have to include other nutritional complications, which unfortunately the data right now, we know much more about Roux-en-Y gastric bypass than we know about one in osmosis gastric bypass. So talking about some of the larger series uh, that have been published on one in osmosis gastric bypass, this is a, a multi-institutional survey, and looking at least on the intraoperative side, there's no doubt that this is a very safe operation. And even though this study uh, separates the complications into three different parts of the learning curve, so talking about the first 50 cases, the second 150 cases, and then over 150 cases, these operations really have a very low risk of intraoperative problems, such as mesenteric ischemia, injury to the liver or the spleen, um, intraoperative leaks, very, very rare. But when we look at the 30-day uh, morbidity, um, bleeding is not very different than ruin white gastric bypass, about a 1.57%. And we see this in, in spe spe especially for this series in the first 150 cases in terms of the, of the learning curve. And talking about deep space uh, surgical site infections, so this includes leaks, uh, remnant leaks, uh, misenterotomies, et cetera, et cetera, about a 0.69% of deep space SSIs, which again is not very different from some modern series looking at these complications from ruin white gastric bypass. Now, I think one thing that I've learned in my, in my last uh, two and a half years here in the region is that complications, for some reason, tend to be uh, regional. I can tell you that when I, when I came here after being, you know, 10 years in practice, I, I experienced complications that were very rare for me in the United States. So I think that, you know, the patient populations are very different. So I think it's very important that we look at the available data from our region which unfortunately is not very, very large, but we also want to use this as an incentive for the groups that are doing a lot of one anastomosis gastric bypass in this part of the world to publish their data. Because one of the largest uh, volumes of one anastomosis gastric bypass in the world is actually happening in the MENA region. So I think that, that in some way we have the responsibility to look at our series and to publish this data so we can contribute to the scientific community. But this was a, a study that uh, Abdel Rahman Nimeri published when he was here, and this was a survey-based study looking at about 148 surgeons that were currently doing one anastomosis gastric bypass in their practice, both as a primary and as a revisional procedure. And one of the things, and I'm going to talk a little bit later in this presentation about this, is that there are still significant technical variations. And when we talk about a lot of the long-term complications that we're going to dig into, I think that this is probably one of the biggest uh, things that we have to mention in this fact. But specifically, I think that most surgeons have experienced uh, leaks, uh, BTEs, uh, and, and a very low mortality. Surprisingly, almost half of the surgeons, so 41% have experienced revisions for malnutrition, not just from their own patients, but patients that were referred to them. The revision rate for bile, uh, sorry, the, the, the number of surgeons that have performed revisions for bile reflux was about a third of them. And I think that this is also a very specific problem in this region, is that most patients tend to not return to their original surgeon when they have a complication. So of the, patient, of the surgeons that were doing revisions, half of the index operation was done somewhere else. So this makes her follow-up very difficult um, to really try to capture some of these long-term complications that we're starting to see. This was uh, an experience out of uh, CCAD when both uh, Matt and Ricard uh, were, were here. And looking at the, the experience with revisions for one anastomosis gastric bypass requiring conversion to ruin Y, the main indications for revision were mechanical complications in about half of the patients, which I, 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 again, I think it, it talks about the technical variations that are, that are seen in this operation in this part of the world. Bile reflux in three out of 16 patients. Uh, weight recidivism, uh, surprisingly, in three out of 16 patients, when I think that this is one of the strongest arguments in favor of this operation based on the available data. And malnutrition, again, two out of 16 patients. So we need to address the elephant in the room. And one of the things that I've noticed here, and I have a very busy endoscopy practice, is that the amount of variations that we see when we scope patients presenting with foregut symptoms 
or malnutrition after one anastomosis gastric bypass is that the anatomic differences are quite remarkable. It's very common that we scope a patient who has a history of one anastomosis gastric bypass and we're seeing a two, three, four centimeter gastric pouch when we know that that doesn't follow the technical principles of the operation. And interestingly, if you look at, the, at uh, a recent study out of IFSO, which was uh, based on a modified Delphi study, very common things where we're trying to reach consensus from surgeons that are practicing and have experience with these type of operations, there's still no, con no consensus on the length of the gastric pouch. So we know what the original description of the operation is, but in practice, we don't know what percent of one anastomosis gastric bypass are being done with a standardized pouch. Same thing with important factors such as measuring your total bowel length during the operation. It turns out that the vast majority of surgeons are not actually doing this. Looking at the indication of one anastomosis gastric bypass in patients presenting with preoperative gastroesophageal reflux disease, and even those that have LA grade C or D esophagitis, there's still no consensus whether this operation should be considered a good anti-reflux operation or, or not. Biliopancreatic limb length, so again, a very critical component of the technical aspects of this operation, no consensus to date. And I just want to show you a video uh, courtesy of uh, Ricard. This was a case done in Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi a few years ago of a patient that presented with, with uh, severe malnutrition after a one anastomosis gastric bypass. And you can see how short this common channel is. So when this patient had a, a, a preoperative upper GI, contrast reached the colon very quickly after the operation. And again, a very long, almost four meter uh, biliopancreatic limb. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna fast forward through, through this video. Um, but I think that one of the main important things, and Henry Ford mentioned this when he was starting his very successful uh, business, as we know today, is that quality means doing it right when no one is looking. And one tendency that we see a lot in, 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 in this field is that even though we know that there are some best practice recommendations, we don't know what the number of surgeons that are actually doing this in their practice really is. Now, Looking at some of the later complications, uh, again, this was a multi-institutional uh, survey on a little over 2,600 patients with a, a five-year follow-up, is that most of the complications that we were seeing usually are happening in the first three years after the operation, whether it's reflux, marginal ulcer, uh, excessive weight loss, um, some nutritional complications such as uh, anemia, micronutrient deficiencies, and even those patients that are experiencing weight, um, weight gain, um, it's happening usually in the first three years. So again, going, uh, going back to this paper which talks about um, the different aspects of the learning curve, some of the complications, and mainly talking about reflux, it's happening across both early and late stages of the learning curve, and the overall rate for this study was about 4%. And if you look at the available data, this is a very wide number. We see some series reporting up to 18% of, of reflux after the operation. Internal hernias are being reported, and if you do a literature search today, there's an increasing uh, number of case, um, case reports on internal hernias, and I think that this really puts into perspective the need or not to close the mesenteric defects, and I think that this is a very complicated debate that I don't want to get into in this uh, specific talk, because I, I think that there's both points in favor and against closing the mesenteric defects uh, in these patients. Um, and again, nutrient deficiencies are happening uh, across the board. And again, going back to that point about standardizing the operation, in this study, looking at the patients that are developing uh, nutritional complications that are requiring revision, so these are cases where not the, the limb lengths were measured both preoperatively and postoperatively, you see that a lot of these patients actually have uh, afferent limbs of about 200 centimeters. You know, there's some outliers like this patient who had a you know, 350 centimeter biliopancreatic limb, but we're also seeing patients with shorter biliopancreatic limbs of 100 and 180 centimeters. So 
I think critically looking at the data that is available today, we can agree that the short-term complications are low. Um, probably in the, in the rate between what is accepted for a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy and a laparoscopic Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. But the long-term complications that are requiring revision in some of the larger series is actually not negligible. So we're seeing about a 2% need for revisions at, a, at about three years, which I think, you know, it's a number that we have to look at very critically. The data suggests that pouches uh, shorter than nine centimeters seem to increase the risk of biliary related complications. So I think that this again points out to the need for technical standardization and respecting the principles of this operation. Um, patients that have a shorter common channel seem to increase the risk of nutritional complications. So there's a lot of, of uh, authors that really push towards measuring total bowel length and planning your operation based on, on the patient's uh, total bowel length. There are significant technical variations. I think we have to be very honest that the data does not support this operation as an indication for management and for patients that have preoperative reflux. And the critical point is that we really need long-term data, and we need long-term data in cases that are well standardized from a, from a technical perspective. So thank you again. Um, and, uh, a picture of our hospital that Carlos has shown before, and we would really like to invite you all to come visit. Thank you very much.